Hi, welcome to Holy Trinity in beautiful Juneau, Alaska. I'm Ann Gifford. I'm a lay member of the church and I'm filling in for Father Gordon this Sunday, July 12th, to uh, deliver this sermon. Uh, this is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost and our gospel text today comes from Matthew. It's the parable of the sower. This has always been a favorite parable for, of mine, maybe because it's one of the few parables that Jesus actually explains for us. In our church's Sunday school program, Godly Play, the materials for parables are kept in golden boxes. Before launching into the story, the storyteller and the children take a look at the lid of the box. The storyteller has a little trouble removing the lid. Eventually, she succeeds. She explains to the children that the lid is like a door. She says, parables have doors too. Sometimes you can't open the door and enter a parable even if you want to. If that happens to you, don't be discouraged. Come back to the parable another time. One day, the parable will open for you. In the case of the parable of the sower, Jesus hands us a golden key to that door. We get to follow the disciples through it and walk beside them as Jesus takes them step by step through each scene that he described to the crowd on the beach while he was preaching. His metaphors are powerful. The images are clear. At least, they are, unless we're like the little boy in godly play who was mystified by how seeds that were sown could grow since he thought they had to be made out of yarn. Once he understood the difference between S-E-W and S-O-W, he, like us, could easily grasp Jesus' explanation. The same problems that vexed gardeners 2,000 years ago are the problems that we have today. The seeds sown on the path get quickly eaten by birds. This represents those who hear the word and fail to understand it from the beginning. Satan snatches the teaching away from their hearts before it can take root. Got it. The seed sown on the rocky ground sprouts quickly because the soil it falls into is shallow. Jesus says these are the people who respond to the word joyfully at first, but then the sun comes out and scorches the plants. They wither away for lack of roots. They like what they hear, but they haven't prepared the soil of their hearts. They haven't added the compost and seaweed of prayer and contemplation. When the heat is on, their roots aren't strong enough to push down through the soil to tap the living water of the word. We can see that. Then there are the seeds that fall among thorns. The seeds grow, but the thorns grow faster. Any gardener in Southeast Alaska who fails to keep up with the horsetails in their garden for a week or two knows exactly how this can happen. Jesus says that these are the people who hear and understand. The word is planted in their hearts and it grows. Perhaps it even begins to flourish. Then they get distracted by the lure of wealth and the cares of the world. They let those thorns choke their spiritual garden and it fails to yield a harvest. We also know how this can happen. Like the love you 2 sings about in their song one, faith leaves you if you don't care for it. Finally, there are the seeds that are sown in good soil. These, Jesus says, are the people who hear the word and understand it. They take it into their hearts and it grows and bears fruit. The word planted in these people yields an abundant harvest, in some cases, a spectacular one. Jesus has opened the golden box 
and handed the meaning of the parable to us. I see him presenting us with something glowing and bejeweled, a little like the shining orbs that he is often depicted uh, as holding in Renaissance paintings. Okay, we've got this beautiful thing. We're cradling it in our hands. We're turning it over, looking at it from all directions. What are we supposed to do with it? I see Jesus looking at us with a smile. He's saying, I just gave you the whole parable. Don't ask me what you're supposed to do with it. To enter the kingdom, you've got to do at least a little of the work yourself. Figure it out. Much as a parable might open for us more easily sometimes than it does at others, the action it calls us to take may vary. Sometimes it takes me a long time to discern what God is calling me to do. In this case, however, I hear this parable practically screaming at me. Black lives matter. Do something now. The world is hurting so much right now. We're reeling from the onslaught of the coronavirus, the economic effects of shutdown, the psychological burdens of quarantine. That is more than enough to deal with right there. Then, in the middle of this hurricane, a volcano of pinup rage and grief explodes at the deliberate, utterly evil murder of a black man, George Floyd, by a police officer who is sworn to uphold the law. And then the murder of a black jogger, Ahmad Arbery, by self-appointed vigilantes who thought he looked out of place in their neighborhood. And the unjustified shooting of a black woman, Breonna Taylor, by police officers who entered her home in the middle of the night. The worst part is, these are only a few of the most recent incidents. And these recent incidents, in turn, are merely a few in a long line of incidents stretching back more than 50 years to the time of the civil rights movement in America, the time when things were supposed to begin improving for people of color. Go back before then, and we find a horror show of lynchings and organized attacks on black Americans, vicious exploitation of people of many different colors and nationalities, and repeated and deliberate attempts to eliminate the indigenous peoples of this continent. Returning to the present, I have been stunned to discover just how much hate still roils around in some white people's hearts. I've also been horrified to learn how much violence and abuse against people of color has been swept under the historical rug. Growing up in Houston, Texas, we never learned about the 1917 Camp Logan mutiny that took place right in our hometown. That terrible event ended with the unjust execution of 19 African-American soldiers and the imprisonment of 63 more. We certainly didn't learn about the Black Wall Street Massacre of 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I heard about both of these terrible events for the first time in the last three years. Closer to home in Juneau, the first time I heard about the 1962 burning of the Douglas Indian Village to make way for Douglas Boat Harbor was in 2015. At that point, I had lived in Juneau more than 30 years. When white people like me don't know about the troubles of the past, the suffering that our predecessors, our ancestors, heaped on others, it becomes easier to dismiss today's complaints by people of color, easier to deny that anything racist is going on. You see and hear remarks like this on social media. I didn't enslave anyone. Why should I pay reparations? Another thing, am I privileged? My privilege comes from the hard work of my parents and forefathers. Being white is not the privilege. What does all this have to do with the parable of the sower? It's this. 
Christ calls on us to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's an act of love, not something we're supposed to do from afar. 56 years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his letter from Birmingham jail of his disappointment with the white moderates who sat on the sidelines during the civil rights movement, who said they approved of the goals but couldn't agree with the methods of nonviolent resistance. He also wrote of his disappointment with the white church. He wanted to hear white ministers tell their congregations to comply with desegregation orders, not merely because those orders were the law, but because integration is morally right and the Negro is your brother. He wanted to see the church engage in the midst of the mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice. I'm thankful that today the Episcopal Church is engaging in that ongoing struggle through ministries for racial reconciliation and by working for so social justice with partners like the Poor People's Campaign. At Holy Trinity, we work for change through several ministries, including our support of the Glory Hall, our prison backpack ministry, and our Head Start Food Basket program. Now I hear Christ calling me to join more deeply in the struggle for social justice. I don't want to be the seed that falls on the road and gets eaten by birds. In the present scenario, that's the person who denies that racism exists. We're all just people, good and bad. The one who says, my white privilege is earned by hard work. I also don't want to be the seed sown on rocky soil that starts to grow, then wilts at the first sign of heat. That's the person who thinks racism is bad, but stands by and does nothing when someone tells a racist joke or says and does something else that's hurtful to a person of color. I don't want to be the seed that's sown among thorns either. That's the person who is shocked by the George Floyd murder, expresses her outrage on social media, and then moves on to the latest news about the pandemic or to a shopping site, letting the cares of her personal life and the lures of consumerism distract her from doing anything more. I don't want to forget how I feel right now when the pain and anger at injustice is burning in my heart. I want to be faithful in my commitment to do more to promote social justice. For me, the first step has been to research how to be a better ally to people of color. When I started this research, what I found broke my heart. There aren't just articles that have been written in the last few months about these things. There are all kinds of thoughtful essays, powerful videos, and helpful compilations that people of color have been creating and assembling for years to help white people like me understand and take action. I didn't know they were out there because I didn't look. I'm still absorbing all the information I've collected. What feels most useful so far is the advice to listen more than I speak, to educate myself about racial injustice, to learn effective interventions for racist acts and to practice them, and to seek out and support organizations that are working for change. To be the seed that is sown on good soil, I know I need Jesus's help. I pray for wisdom in choosing what to do and how to do it. I pray for the will to follow through on the things I've begun. I also pray that with all our efforts, the seed sown during the 1960s civil rights movement will finally produce an abundant harvest of justice and reconciliation. Amen.